Welcome to the Modern Law Library. I'm your host, Lee Rawls, and today I'm joined by Stephen Wright, author of the book, The Coyotes of Carthage. Stephen, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be with you. So, Stephen, we do a lot of nonfiction on the Modern Law Library podcast, and I'm delighted to have a fiction book uh, to talk with everyone about. Could you give people a little bit of a background into yourself and how you came to write this novel? Sure. So my name's Steve Wright. I am currently a clinical associate professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where I have sort of the unique role of teaching both in the law school and in the creative writing department. I've trained formally, obviously, both as a lawyer going to law school. I clerked for a federal judge after that, and then I worked for the United States Department of Justice for about five years in the voting rights section. The voting rights section enforces a host of civil rights era statutes, including the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. But I left that in around 2000, I want to say 2012. I really wanted to become a writer. And so I was fortunate enough to get into the Masters of Fine Arts creative writing program here at the University of Wisconsin. And I never left. And so when I was ending up that experience as a graduate student in the MFA program, the Masters of Fine Arts program, I knew I wanted to write a book. And my friends and my mentors and my classmates, you know, they they told me that you should write, that I should write a book that only I could write, that I should fictionalize some experiences that I had in my life and bring them onto the page to form a book. And that's what the Coyotes of Carthage did. The Coyotes of Carthage really drew very heavily upon my experience as an attorney and a civil rights attorney to tell the story of Andre Ross. Andre is a political consultant who's sort of down on his luck. When we meet him, he's gotten in trouble with his boss. His fiance has left him and his brother is really, really sick. And so the book follows his experience running a grassroots dark money campaign in the backwoods of South Carolina. And that choice was one of the first things that I found so fascinating was that this man is doing all sorts of political chicanery that I feel like surely the voting rights section would have been looking into. And so I'm just fascinated by the way you were able to get us to sympathize with this man who is doing a series of, you know, what could be seen as either immoral political acts or survival. So could you talk a little bit about how you came to develop Dre as a character? So, you know, when I was in the MFA program, I I was a little bit anxious because I had decided to leave the law. And so going to grad school, it's a program that was full time, but I still wanted some type of connection to the legal world. So I decided that I would take cases from the local state public defender. And by and large, they were just appellate cases. You know, I, I clearly didn't have the schedule to do trials. But I did have the time to do appeals. And I would go across Wisconsin and you'd meet young men in particular, somewhere between the ages of 18 and 30. And I would introduce myself and I would explain who I was. And, you know, in that first meeting with a client, I'm sure your listeners are well aware, you have to build some level of trust. So I shared my life experience. They shared their life experience. And they were always fascinated by my time as a voting rights and election lawyer. And I guarantee you absolutely everyone serving major time in a state or federal prison has very strong views on politicians. I repeatedly heard anecdotes that, or, or philosophies that politicians are nothing more than criminals who just haven't been arrested yet. And so when I met a lot of folks, a lot of those guys that I was that I would come to represent, some of them were convicted or had pled guilty to being some type of a con man. And so really Dre uh was a was sort of a synthesis and a hybrid of many of the guys I was talking to and meeting during that time. Individuals who had had sort of interesting lives themselves, but who had ended up on the wrong side of the law. And so I wanted to write a character that sort of imbued those values, a character who would fundamentally 
have those same type of values, those same types of get ahead politicians or criminals type philosophies, but who was able to actually use the political system for his own sort of personal gain rather than resorting to actual criminal behavior. I know that I have actually heard people say, and I think this was a a judge who once said at a, uh, a dinner I was at, he said, you know, the a real tragedy is that some of the people who could be the most successful business people in the United States are instead serving time on drug charges. You know, had they had the opportunities and advantages, you know, they had they had the skill set to rise. And you see Andre able, at least at some level, to use those skills. But, you know, as the reader, I'm still kind of torn. I'm like, but is it good for Andre even? It's it's obviously mm-hmm. better than some other options, but I don't want to spoil too much in this book, but I do want to talk about the kind of two worlds that Andre inhabits in here and how you were able to really bring them to life. And and I did feel like both of these worlds and the people in them were so fleshed out. And one is DC, both, you know, with his brother's family, his brother who's suffering from ALS, and also the political consultancy that he works for and his mentor, uh, and then Carthage, South Carolina. So let's start with DC. You wrote this really powerful figure of Andre's mentor, Mrs. Fitz. So could you talk a little bit about Mrs. Fitz and and how she came into being? Yeah. So, you know, Mrs. Fitz um, is a character in the book. We meet her in chapter one, and she's sort of been his shepherd. When we know in the novel that Andre, when he was a teenager, he got into some trouble. And so Miss Fitz was somebody whom he met who was able to sort of help him change his life and to get on, you know, a different path. I don't know if it's a better path, but definitely a different path. And she is a DC power broker. And so she sort of mentors him in the ways of being a political consultant or a political operative. And, you know, she's very much based upon many of the great mentors that I had. Um, You know, she's both kind and generous and she cares very much about him, but she's more than willing to tell him when he's wrong, right? Or she's more than willing to correct him when he needs a correction. And so, you know, that type of tough love, I've been very fortunate to have several mentors who have shown me that kind of kindness, who, who loved you enough to tell you when you were wrong and who cared enough to help you to fix it. And so that's really where Miss Fitz came from. And to me, that was one of the things that was so fascinating, which was you had Mrs. Fitz, who Andre clearly had a real love for, and there was actual affection there. But everyone else in this business, in this dark money organization, it just seems to be a predator and prey type mentality. And so I I just found that fascinating. What made you structure it in such a way that there was this really close relationship between himself and his mentor. But other than that, it didn't feel like he had anyone work-wise in D.C. You know, it was his political consultant life was based upon a lot of political consultants that I just happened to come across in my time in D.C. You know, I mean, any job where you're going to be on the road for 45 weeks a year is always just going to tax your personal relationships. And that relationships with the, the other characters in Dre's life is further complicated by the fact that his job is to learn to manipulate people, is to how to convince a community to act and many times against their own best interests. And so the actual logistics of the job combined, I think, with the morality of the job made relationships for him very, very difficult. And But the only person who could perhaps understand that is his mentor, is the woman who sort of trained him in the difficulty of the job. And I think that's actually a pretty common recurring theme, you know, throughout literature, that mentors helping their mentees or helping someone find their way are really the only person who can sort of understand what the character is going through. So that my listeners can get kind of an idea about the language and the style of writing, I would love for you to read us a passage, if you don't mind. Sure, I'm happy to do that. So I'll just be reading from the first few pages of uh, chapter one at the very beginning. 
Andre marvels, watching a kid, a stranger of maybe 16, pinch another wallet. This lift makes the kids fifth, at least that Andre's seen this morning. Two on the train, two on the underground platform, and now this one on the jam-packed escalator that climbs towards the surface. The kid's got skills, mad skills. He makes his lift and keeps on moving. There, right there. The kid picks up another, his sixth, with the practice grace of a ballerino. This time, the mark, some corporate chump, probably a lobbyist, with slicked back hair and a shit-eating grin. No one suspects a thing, and why would they? This kid blends in, looks like a prep school student, and who knows? Perhaps he is. His aesthetic complete with a book bag, khakis, and a dog-eared copy of de Tocqueville tucked beneath his arm. The kid reminds Andre of himself at that age, lean, hungry, still eyes with smooth skin. But Andre concedes that he never possessed this kid's natural talent. I love the detail of de Tocqueville under his arm. <laughs> So just, we'll advance a little bit further in the plot, because I, I do want to talk about the actual electioneering and, and political chicanery that goes on. So Andre has gotten himself in trouble with his past campaign. And this is a job that it doesn't seem like anyone else wants. They say that it's it's just a tiny little job, only $350,000 budget. And they're sending him to this little town called Carthage, South Carolina. Can you talk about basically what Andre is sent to do and how you came up with this idea of this dark money campaign? Sure. So we know uh, three or four pages later after what we've read that Andre reports to his mentor, Miss Fitz. And because he's just returned from a campaign that he won but was particularly nasty, she thinks it's probably best in his interest that he leave D.C. and just lay low on a smaller, lower-profile campaign. And so the firm has been hired by a mining company to persuade a community in the, I guess, northwesternmost corner of South Carolina, the part of the, the state that borders Tennessee that has a lot of beautiful rainforest and mountains and rivers. The mining company has hired him to persuade the locals to sell the land so that they can mine the gold that lies beneath the trees and the forest and those hills. And so by chapter two, he's in South Carolina. You know, South Carolina, I, I picked it in large part because South Carolina has amongst the worst campaign finance laws in the country. Campaign finance laws, as you know, there are plenty of federal ones, but those by and large govern races and contests and candidates for federal election. You're the president, your senator, your members of the House of Representatives. But state and local races are generally governed by state law. And so every year, think tanks do a ranking of which states have good laws and which ones have best, which, of course, is subjective and, and depending upon how you view campaign finance laws. But all the studies tend to agree that South Carolina has among the fewest meaningful restrictions. And so it is the type of place where it's almost like the Wild West. Uh, individuals can pump a lot of what we call dark money, which is corporate anonymous money, into a campaign without any type of regulation. And so, you know, the town was, the town and the people were based upon my experience in the, at the DOJ. As I said, when you enforce, say, the Voting Rights Act, you would go into a small community and you would learn how that community's political infrastructure works. You would know, you know, these are the people that you have to talk to in town to be successful. This is the type of get out the vote mechanism that you need in order to win a school board race. And I remember that I would meet so many candidates, the local librarian who serves on the school board, the, you know, the local small business owner who also happens to be mayor. You would meet these individuals and you would learn, especially in smaller towns, counties, and jurisdictions, these individuals ran on a very shoestring budget. I can remember meeting one, uh, one woman who was running, I believe, for a, a county level position. And her entire campaign, she had five kids and she would just sort of squirrel away 50 to $75 every month, and she saved up for two years. 
And she would get some donations from church friends and things like that. But it wasn't, we weren't talking about a massive budget. And so I was always sort of curious what would happen if the Amazons, the Walmarts, the really big guys came to town and they have very sophisticated political operations. And they decided that they wanted to run against somebody who just saved $75 a month. And so a lot of the conflict comes from there. What happens when someone with a lot of money decides to intervene in a local election where, and especially in a poor community, where the candidates don't quite have the same financial footing? And I guess I didn't know as much about the straw man process or idea before I read this novel. And I, I'm used to, you know, speaking to authors of nonfiction, but so much of this, I was just like, oh, I'm, I'm still learning. I mean, this is a novel, but I'm still learning and I'm alarmed. But he decides he needs a straw man. Can you talk a little bit about who he ends up choosing and how you formed these characters? Sure. So... The straw man is the idea that he needed a local face to help run the campaign. I think we may have noted it, but if not, one of the tensions of the book is that Andre Ross is a middle-aged African-American male. And the town that he goes to, Carthage, South Carolina, I believe is 95% white. And so he sticks out. And so not only is it a 95% white community, it's also a fairly conservative community. I think the line in the book is it's 80% Republican and the remaining 20% are people who think that the Republican Party has gone too soft. And so he quickly realizes that he cannot be the face of the campaign. And so he partners with some locals and those local, the local couple, Tyler and Charlene Lee, the two of them become the face of the community. And, you know, those two were definitely influenced by and large, once again, by personal experience. You know, I grew up largely in the South. My, we, my family moved around a lot, but I was born in Nashville. I graduated from high school in Augusta, Georgia. I went to college and grad school in North Carolina. My first job out of school was in Arkansas. So I felt like I knew the South well, and that was another reason that I put it there. And I also knew the people. And so Tyler and Charlene were the type of people that I got to know very well during my times. They're smart people. They are passionate about their community. They're passionate about their religion. They're passionate about their nation. Uh, but, you know, they've been dealt a, a rather tough hand in life. And so they're not only sort of poor, but they're sort of desperately poor. And so Andre is able to manipulate that desperation to his and the campaign's benefit, and they become the face of his initiative to persuade the locals to sell the land to the mining corporation. One thing I appreciated as a reader was that these characters, I think in another writer's hands, may have been painted as, oh, these are plain and simple people, and they aren't simple. They're human beings, and they're very complex, and you don't get on board with everything that they say or think or do, but they feel like real people. So, you know, just feedback from a reader. I, I really felt that the characters in this book were not stereotypes. They were, they were real humans. So that's Thank you. me vouching, <laughs> me vouching for my, for my listeners uh, about the coyotes of Carthage. And speaking of that title, let's talk about how you arrived at it and the theme of the coyote. I grew up in the country, and mm -hmm. uh, we weren't used to seeing coyotes. And if you saw a coyote, it was dead or something had gone gravely wrong. Uh, it was rabbit or something, and you were supposed to get away from it. But now that I live in the city, there are now urban coyotes, and it's it's an interesting problem of... Uh, the way that we've encroached into their territory. So I already had pre-existing feelings about coyotes, and I would love to hear how you made this a theme of the book. So this was one of those sort of very eccentric personal choices in that I am a big nature documentary guy. There's nothing that David Attenborough can do that I <laughs> don't love. He could read the phone book and I would be enthralled. 
And so a, a lot of the book deals, because it's in that part of the nation, deals with uh, or presents the theme of nature and natural resources and animals, uh, which is another contrast from Andre, who spent most of his life in Washington, D.C. And so I knew pretty early on that there was a metaphor for a coyote and Andre's sort of lot in life. I knew that one of the themes that I would be exploring with Andre as a character is sort of loneliness and desperation and sort of this will to survive. And the image of the coyote kept coming up over and over again. And so I think at some point they just sort of converged in my mind, this idea that he would be a coyote, that Andre could be a metaphorical coyote that shares a lot with the actual coyotes in the wild. And for anyone who comes from a region that doesn't have coyotes, could you talk a little bit about their characteristics that that reflected to you how Andre was? One of the things that strikes me is that many people who aren't familiar with them think that coyotes are, are just predators, but they're also scavengers. And so that seemed meaningful to me. But what else did you see in that? Yeah, I mean, they play an important part in the food chain. Um, for people out in the West, I, let me say I am I am fully aware that this is a, a, a big controversy on how we go about thinking about and reflecting upon the coyotes. Um, I, I understand that, uh, you know, especially for farmers and ranchers, you know, coyotes can devastate your flock. Um, and so they sort of have a bad rep for that. But you know, they also serve, I think, purposes of keeping vermin in check. But the characteristic that I think appealed to me is, um, you know, I, I've I've lived in a couple of places where I've been able to see coyotes. They're they're good looking animals to me. Uh, but you know, I think what they're sort of largely known for is uh, sort of that isolation, that loneliness, that howling at the moon. And that's what I think persuaded me to include them in in the novel. And finally, I have to ask you about. Writing a book with election intrigue in the middle of the 2020 election. But as I have been talking to you, it sounds like you definitely didn't just start writing this book. This has been in process for several years. What were some of the things that struck you as a fiction writer? Then also looking at, I, I don't know quite when you started, but the 2016 election, the 2018 election, the 2020 election, the things that we're dealing with now. And just to orient my listeners, since things seem to be changing from day to day, we are talking on October 5th. Yeah, so, you know, I got I got lucky a little bit. Um, I started writing in 2014, and that was long before you know, the president threw his hat into the ring. And so a lot of the reviews for my books have have said that the community of Carthage represents a lot of a lot of the individuals who support the president. And that when I sat down, obviously that wasn't my intent. I wanted to write about the communities that I knew. And they just happened to overlap. And so I ended up being very, very lucky that, you know, especially when we sent it around to publishers, there was tremendous interest just because people wanted to see more political fiction books that dealt with issues facing that community. But, you know, it was one of those type of things where I was fortunate that I had uh, some life experience in a in, in the political arena. You know, I always sort of sensed that it would be somehow relevant, uh, although I didn't I couldn't have predicted how relevant it will be. I mean, the, the one of the great things about writing political fiction is we have a federal election every two years in this country. Uh, we have state and local elections often, you know, more times than that. So there's always an opportunity to talk about elections. And in particular, there's always an opportunity to talk about local elections, which I hope is the real takeaway for the book for everyone. You know, we spend so much time thinking about the president and our senators and our congressmen and women. And don't get me wrong, those jobs obviously are tremendously important. But I think one of the things that we've seen in the past six months since we've all been in the pandemic together is that your local elected officials matter a great deal too, right? Your local mayor and county is determining what beaches are open. Your school board is determining which schools are going to be open and which ones aren't. We know that our local sheriffs and our local prosecutors are often elected and obviously their conduct is coming under a microscope. So I hope that the book reminds people that your local elections are just as important to your day-to-day life as anything that you vote on in a federal ballot. Yeah, I'd have to say one of the more heartrending things 
reading the book was the way some pre-existing local officials ended up, again, I don't want to spoil anything because this really is just such a wonderful read, going in knowing not much, but it was these outside forces turning local communities against their pre-existing local leadership. And it's not like the local leadership had completely clean hands or anything, but you were seeing the way a local community became twisted by outside agitators as well. And I, I just found that fascinating. So we have talked a lot about the book itself, but I'd love to talk more and get more in depth about what you're doing right now, uh, in addition to, you know, talking about your new book, and what it's been like working for the University of Wisconsin Law School in the time of COVID. Yeah, so I'm a professor. Um, I, I originally joined the faculty as a clinical uh, professor. So for the listeners who don't know, law schools offer what are called clinics, which are basically small law firms within the schools that teach law students the actual practice of, of law. And so I run the Wisconsin Innocence Project. I'm the co-director there. And we investigate and litigate claims by individuals who uh, have been wrongfully convicted of serious crimes. Uh, you know, I love the job and I really adore our students. Uh, you know, it was, I think, at least for me, the rapidness through by which we shifted from not in person to online, it was really what caught me more off guard than anything else. I think the chancellor announced that we would be going online, I think it was a couple of days before spring break, so we got a little bit of, of, of a cushion. But uh, I was... I was teaching. I was also teaching a creative writing class at that time. And then all of a sudden, we just got an email saying, when you come back, prepare to do this whole thing online. And, you know, I, words like Zoom, I don't think had even entered the popular vocabulary, the popular discussion. And so, you know, the transition was a little bit bumpy, I think, for many of us. But, you know, I was fortunate enough to teach summer school. And so now I feel pretty confident in teaching the online portions and the in-person portions of my class. All right. And then I have to know what your next project is. If you have a next project yet, <laughs> and, and no pressure, because I know that we're all trying to do a lot in a very strange time and you have many other responsibilities. But yeah, uh, the Coyotes of Carthage, it definitely, you know, it's it's a satisfying finish to me. But if you wanted to follow this character further, you could, or you could feel that you'd left him in the place you wanted to leave him. So that was definitely a question I had as I turned the last page was whether you had any plans to follow him further or whether this was the journey that you were taking us on with him. So I had not planned on writing another book following this. You know, part of what we have been very, very lucky about is that um, there was a great deal of interest in the television show and making a television show out of it and selling the rights to it. And that would obviously go beyond the book. So, you know, it looks so far so good, but, you you know, you can't guarantee what tomorrow looks like with the pandemic. But my hope is that we'll see that these characters will show up on your TV screen, most likely, I think, on Netflix. And if it's a success, I'm sure there will have to be a second season. And if there's a second season, there'll probably have to be a story that, that extends beyond the actual novel. But but, uh, but yeah. I actually didn't know that uh, the rights had been sold and, and that there was that possibility. So I'm excited. If my listeners are hearing this in a while and we're in the world where filming can continue, any ideas? Is it still going to be The Coyotes of Carthage or a different title? You know, I don't know. You know, we're, it's one of those type of things where we had a lot of meetings and we had a lot of talks uh, right before the pandemic. And then obviously the pandemic just changed a lot of everything. But my understanding is that it's going to continue to be the Coyotes of Carthage. Uh, you know, I, I hope that the television show will thrill people as much as I hope that the book does. Uh, but, you know, it's been sort of the, the entire book experience has really been sort of exceptional, far more than I think I could have ever anticipated. And just to wrap up, if there was anything that you would want to tell a reader before they picked up this book, what would it be? 
You know, one of the interesting things about the book is that it, it found a home in many different communities. On the front cover is a blurb from, by John Grisham, who was so kind and generous in, in endorsing the book. And it also includes such literary luminaries as uh, Lori Moore. And so, you know, the book doesn't fit neatly, I think, into any one sort of category on the shelf. But I hope that the readers will find that it's a good and enjoyable story, even if you can't quite have expectations of of what will come next. And Stephen, if anyone wants to pick up the book or wants to reach out to you to talk more about it after they've read it, do you have a website or somewhere that they could reach you? Yeah, the best way to reach me is on Twitter at Stephen H. Wright. I'm on there often talking about books and the law and sometimes Star Trek. (laughs) Well, I hope that you get some more followers after people hear our interview. Thank you to Stephen Wright, author of The Coyotes of Carthage, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to my listeners for joining us for this episode of the Modern Law Library. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, review, and subscribe in your favorite podcast listening service.